So I just want to thank our sponsors real fast. Uh, oh. And so oh, it's okay. I can I will <laughs> I can remember them. Um, <laughs> And uh, so thank you to Emerald Data Networks, Equinox, Open Library Initiative, and the Mobius Libraries for their generous sponsorship of our wonderful conference. I'm looking forward to everyone's chat today. We do still have a 325 spot. Um, if anybody is feeling inspired, I will, I will put the link in the chat in a sec here. Uh, first up for our lightning talks, we have Ruth Frazier and then Andrea, your second. It's me. So I am going to talk. I have way too many monitors all over, so I apologize. One second. Uh, about the community spotlight, which is something that is traditionally scheduled to be done on a quarterly basis, but we know life happens. So last year it happened twice, and we spotlighted Chris Burton from uh, Niagara Falls Public Library. Niagara Public Library, maybe some other words in there. Um, and then also Irene Patrick uh, as part of NC Cardinal. Uh, but the reason that I'm here today is to actually encourage you to submit more people. The purpose of the Community Spotlight is, of course, uh, to put a spotlight on people who have contributed to the Evergreen community in any any manner, a way that you want to um, basically shout out and, and what they've done. And then, um, so to provide some accolades, but also I think it, part of the goal of it is to expose all of the different things that different people bring to the community. So I am gonna throw over into chat. Um, there is a form to fill out for this. I'm going to put that form right there. And then if you happen to go to uh, the um, evergreen-ils.org website, and I'm going to share my screen again real quickly, hopefully real quickly, you know how that goes. Um, you can use our um, special Google search up here in the website and just put in community spotlight and you will get a list. Uh, and it's, it's not in necessarily a sensical order, but they're there. And so um, to see uh, different people who have been spotlighted and to read about them, uh, but we would love to get more nominations for the community spotlight. And yeah, that's it. Anything else? Any questions about that super quick? I have one minute. You can ask questions in one minute. The only stipulation for this is they have to have something to do with the Evergreen project. Um, can this be shared with other staff at our libraries? Yes, definitely. And it can, um, they can, people can be spotlighted for the things that they've done in your library organization, things they've done for the Evergreen project, um, whatever. So yes, please do share it far and wide. And this is something that's managed by the outreach committee uh, who meets regularly. And then we interview the people on that nomination form and um, usually it's Andrea who writes up a really awesome article about it and I help her a little bit, but she's better at it. She's better at everything. There you go. I'm done. Oh, wow. I will, uh, I'm not Perfect sure if timing, that Ruth. was a pun no or pressure. no pressure because I'm going to talk about the everything permission, which I'm definitely not better at. So, um, Aaron, I'm just going to put, so it again into chat, the, uh, URL for the Evergreen Project website. And then there is a, um, let me pop back to the home page. There is this enhanced Google search right here. And if you just put community spotlight in here, the actual um, spotlight articles go out through our social media portals. And then they are of course included on the website and then they are included in the annual report as well. So if I just boop that. Thank you, Ruth. Andrea, yeah. will you be sharing your screen? Yes, I will. 
Okay, perfect. All right. I have slides, y'all. Okay. Today, I'm going to talk to you very, very briefly about uh, the everything permission, or as my colleague Jason Etheridge termed it, the almost everything permission. So um, this is a very, very short overview. I am not a, a technical person, a developer, so please don't ask me any weird edge case questions about how this works. This is a general overview. And yes, thank you, Michelle. I hope that somebody would pick up on, on that. Um, so this is actually comes from, um, I, I dragged this out of Mike one at one point many years ago, um, trying to answer this for a customer. I was wise enough to put it in a, uh, in a Google doc and there it sat for many years until I'm like, you know what, I should tell everyone about this. So we all probably know this. Um, everything is not really everything. We have all probably encountered this permission failure, um, where somebody has the everything permission, but something does not work for them. Um, works most of the time, but not all the time. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about when this doesn't work and what to potentially do about that. So Evergreen checks permissions in one of two ways. This is a very basic flow chart uh, describing the way it does at the time of action. So this is a single database level function saying, hey, can I do this? And it's invoked at the time that you do the thing. You try to you know, add an item. You try to check out a book. It is um, saying, hey, can I do this? Um, yes. Or do I have the Evergreen permission? Yes. If you have neither of those things, sorry, you're going to cry. You can't do the thing. So the second way is actually where it gets a little bit complicated. Um, so the second way asks, will I be able to do this? And it is not check the everything permission. Um, what it's doing is looking at and pulling an entire set of permissions for you at a specific location. That is in italics because the specific location part is important. And then the function goes through that list of permissions like one at a time until it finds one that lets you perform your potential action. And this is known as the user has perm at function. It is different than the everything permission. So practically speaking, what this means is that staff have to have uh, working locations assigned correctly. That is critical. If they do not have the correct working locations assigned or they're missing them all together, um, this user has perm check will fail because it is dependent on a specific location or is checking a specific location. So is there a recent, very annoying example of this cropping up? Yes. And thank you to John Amundsen for filing this bug. Um, so this came up fairly recently, um, just about a month or two ago. Uh, it was discovered that staff accounts without working locations are unable to see the new Angular staff catalog. Well, this is because loading the Angular staff catalog calls that user has permat function. And therefore, people without working locations won't be able to see that even if they have the everything permission, because it's calling, again, a separate thing. So why can't user has permat check everything? Well, right now, um, that would get a little bit messy. Um, it would execute this as give me all the permissions for all the locations that this user can do things at, and it would just dump all of that right up to wherever was asking for this and cause pain and havoc. So. Um, those of you who have worked with me on software development know that I like to cite often uh, through development, all things are possible. So there are a couple of potential paths that this could change with development. Um, there's legitimate pluses and minuses to each of them and certainly a community conversation that could be had here about the best way to implement it. Um, first is to go through the code, identify where that user has permat function is in use and add a separate everything check to those areas that don't have it. Or alternatively, teach user has permat to check everything, but to do something reasonable with the results, i.e. not dump all of that data, not ask it for all the things at all the places, just teach it to some manners, really, to behave a little bit better. So moral of the story, even if you have everything, you really don't. It's like your deep Wednesday thought from me. But don't panic. Make sure you check those working locations and, you know, Bring a towel. So that's it. Over to Debbie. All right. And let's see. Slideshow. Okay. I am here with not as good of a title, but with a cool picture. So I'm here to do our annual 
documentation and interest group evangelism. Uh, so here we have our mascot, the boar who digs graves. Uh, and so talking about documentation interest group or what we call DIG. Um, and several of you may have been at the pre-conference. It was all things documentation. So you will have heard some of that stuff uh, already. Yeah, Gina, we decided after last year it was going to be. <laughs> um, because there is nothing worse than no document um, or incorrect documentation, uh, even worse than no documentation. Uh, and here we have a picture of George the cat, who is Andrea's. Uh, here we have Louis McKenna, Taryn's dog. So DIG is a documentation interest group. We've got a link here to our wiki. We have meetings monthly on the first Thursdays of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is 11 a.m. Pacific um, and 1 o'clock my time. Uh, and we just decided at the last meeting that we were going to switch to having all of our meetings on Zoom. Um, and so that's how it will be. Um, also, we have a Hackfest on Friday. So uh, that is this Friday, and we have a whole separate room for documentation, and you are welcome to jump in and out uh, from documentation to authorities to the developers. Uh, it's just very informal, but we'll be working on some stuff and talking about some um, future direction stuff. Uh, for current documentation, this is Terrence Dog Pepper. Um, so in the last year, we had quite a number of commits with lots of authors and 10 unique committers, which is great. Worked on all of kind of the documentation that's been around for the last year. We added three new core committers. So we're very excited about that. So we have Andrea um, and then added Blake and Gina and Lynn. So yay for that. Um, and importantly to uh, the pictures here is that on our Zoom calls, we have a permanent agenda item called pet show and tell. Uh, so hence all of the pets. Uh, but we also have doc show and tell. Uh, we try to do something every other month or every few months, um, which is describing something uh, documentation related. So we've had like how to contribute already, create a documentation, and we've had one on, um, I think, Antora. So um, those are all good things at the meetings. And then um, we also have a docs reorganization project. Uh, and if you go back and look at the pre-conference, um, Gina talks about this uh, quite a bit. So, um, and here, oh, I guess it's a slide after this. Um, I have a link to the spreadsheet because we're completely reorganizing, making sure we have full documentation or updated documentation with updated screenshots um, everywhere. So try to get the, documentation most comprehensive. So we have a lot of ways that you can help um, with that. So um, for instance, on the reorg, you know, find your um, area, if you're a catalog or if you're an authorities expert, if you're a, um, you know, acquisitions or you're a system administrator, look over that section, see if there's anything wrong. And um, if so, help or just send us something uh, and we will take care of it for you. And here we have Francis, Jennifer's dog, or Jennifer's cat. Um, so this again, all the ways that you can help um, and the link to the reorg. This is Tara, Andrea's cat, other cat. And so thank you to everybody who contributes documentation um, and to all the developers who write really good release notes so that it makes documentation easier. Um, so yeah, and don't uh, worry if you want to contribute any documentation, just give it to us in any format and we will fix it so that it will go right into our community documentation. And these are my cats, Zoe and Naya. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, Debbie. Ah, oh, it's me now. All right, Infinity is, is up. Now. And then Blake is next after her. Infinity here. Okay, so uh, I don't have any great visuals, but I do have this mosquito bite on my nose. So, you know, hopefully that will tide you over. Uh, in any case, um, I wanted to talk about what it was like converting from the traditional OPAC uh, or the TPAC to the bootstrap. Uh, there has been some people just based on the new dev committee, uh, all those meetings that have not converted over. So I just wanted to kind of like do a quick checklist of what we did for this. So, um, 
the docs has a really good uh, little note here of like which file that you have to go through. So if you're someone who directly works with the system, uh, you'll be working with the, uh, the host file. Um, and it's really just as simple as like uncommenting uh, a line in terms of, okay, we're just going to use Bootstrap now. So what we did was at Biblimation is uh, put this up on a test server after we converted over to, um, or upgraded that server rather to 3.6.5 was one, that's a version that we have when it became live for production. Uh, you do all your customizations there. That's going to be like a whole entire different uh, discussion. Uh, but after you do your customizations and look for any bugs that you might be interested in backporting, if there's a newer version available, et cetera, um, what we did was we had this available um, for the internal staff to look through. They tested it out, every single action that we could possibly get done on a spreadsheet, uh, along with any notes of things that we have to fix. Um, after that, we decided to do kind of like a dry run of like a mini webinar of showing this to our user experience group, which is a steering committee. Uh, they do a lot of testing for us and feedback, et cetera. So uh, we just kind of like show them what it looks like and um, had their feedback on anything that needed to be corrected, et cetera. So uh, when it did become a, at the time where we wanted to bring this into production, we had about like a month's worth of time where we did a open webinar for everyone just went over some big features. I think the biggest one is probably in my opinion, the my account screen um, that you're going to be using on the public side. Uh, before then I made sure to go through our public documentation that is available for patrons in terms of like using the OPAC and had that convert over to Bootstrap. And uh, for people who are reluctant to change, I made sure to say that it works the same, just looks different. Um, and then my account screen is going to pretty much work the same as well, but it does have like a lot of rework there. So I would focus on that if you're going to be doing a webinar. Uh, we uploaded it to a public test server that we have um, current credentials or login. So the staff was able to log in and use it um, and also the public uh, link as well. So after we gave them about like a month, we had it go live. And it's really just as simple again as looking at this file and uh, uncommenting a line out. So uh, I did make some promotional materials through Canva. So this was like my librarian uh, experience at work. I used to love doing flyers. So I did one um, that's more like general interest so that I could fit every library in our consortium uh, and just had to be Bibliomation branded. So uh, we put in just really quickly, I, I tried to highlight the mobile view because that's, uh, I think, like where Bootstrap shines, in my opinion. Uh, talked about searching, records, account information, uh, registration, if we do have that available for which library wants to have self-registration. Lists, I think, is probably a big part to highlight, so I would do that too. Um, and then I also put some filler in. Here's like the link to um, the help uh, page for patrons. And I also had the same information, but put that in a different format that's downloadable um, so that you could have like a online type of handout. So I use that on Canva. I just used a free account for that. Um, and since then, it's been a pretty smooth uh, ride. So I uh, hope that you enjoyed that. And maybe it's uh, helpful to you if you want to convert your stuff over to Bootstrap. Yay, thank you, Gina. I know a lot of us are looking forward to that in our upcoming upgrades. And that was uh, a global switch. Sorry, just to answer. Okay, that. yes, I was gonna I was gonna say. Okay, so you you did everybody all at once, same day. Yes. Yeah. Um if and, you want uh, the flyer, just message me privately. I'll also throw my email on there so I can send it to you. I just want to get that done before Blake goes. <laughs> can you do it per org unit? I don't yes. know. Not that I've seen, but uh, maybe other people might. You can. You can? Okay. Yeah, we just did it globally. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Gina. Blake is up, and then we can have some more Q&A time, or there's still five minutes for someone to take that last spot. All right. Thanks, Blake. All right. Hey, everybody. My turn. Five minutes. Um, this really probably deserves a whole session or maybe even a pre-conference, but I thought I'd throw out there the the bib and porter tool that we've been using and curated over the last 
geez, seven years. We found ourselves needing to import MARC records into Evergreen. Just turns out everybody needs to do that. <laughs> and one of the issues is the dollar sign nine. You got to get that in there and tag the participating library. So that's the first thing. And then what if the bib already exists? And you know, how do you merge the 856s? Check out the URLs, see if they're the same, see if they're different, add or whatever. So we created a script to do that. And then it got more complicated because another, another library wanted it as well. <clears throat> and they were, one was overdrive and one was just getting it from another FTP server or one was Markive. So we've we've landed on a universal script. And um, last year I created a, I'll put it here in chat, the launchpad wish list bug with some code attached. Um, I think I've made a pretty good attempt at documenting it, but I'll show my screen. Let's see here. Just gonna show one window so it's um, bigger. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of windows. Hmm, which one is it? I was expecting it to give me a mini version of what the window looks like. Instead, I have a list of text. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, we've had a couple people say that the thing they're looking for is not appearing <laughs> in their list. So uh, I'm just going to do. Be a there. I'm going to do entire screen. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay, so here's here's the. Uh, documentation it basically wrapped up in the config file so if you go and click on that launchpad bug you know the code's there and then i'll kind of go over real quick here what you can do with the tool so first of all you tell it where to put the log file can you see this okay it's pretty small uh okay let's that's but, as big i as mean it's, it's text though okay well the config file has a lot of documentation kind of built into it, but um, I'll just go over real quick. You have a log file for the tool. You give it your domain name of your evergreen site. And then the the source name, this is a arbitrary string that it will create in the config bib source table where bibs, you know, have a source in the catalog or when you're doing cataloging, you'll see that drop down menu there. I'm going to skip this setting for this talk. It's more complicated. And then we have um, a bib tag, which is a way that it'll know in the future that this was one of the bibs that it was responsible for importing. So it, when it comes back a second time on another run, say you run every month or something, it can find the ones it's worked with before. It needs to know what folder to save the old stuff into. So it can refer to that folder to make sure it doesn't re-import the same file twice. So you keep... Um, uh, maybe a year's worth of stuff in there. So when it goes out to the FTP server or wherever to get the files, the mark files. By the way, I should probably mention that it can import from a folder. It can import from an FTP server. It can import from Cloud Libraries API. So there's a whole API in here interacting with the Cloud API API. Um, and it can import from Markive's HTTPS, which was a relatively new thing that Markive started doing. Then you list out a common separated list of short name um, org units. So that's how it knows what to do. The dollar sign nine to the 856 is coming in. And then you have a flag whether or not you want it to merge the nine. So if it matches a record that's already in evergreen, whether or not um, it goes ahead and merges the nines together or not, most of the time you're gonna want that. You can flag this to import as is. Um, you can flag it to not import anything that doesn't match or vice versa, basically. Um, it needs to know a place to store some temp files, how to log into your own Evergreen database. And this is the part where the record source is defined. You can define a folder, or cloud library, or archive um, HTTPS. And if it's an FTP server, you define the server, the login, the password, whether or not you want to recurse the directory tree. Um, and then this stuff has, these are your special settings if you're using cloud library. So your key and your certificate to interact with your API. Um, if it's a folder that you're importing from, you pass it 
uh, configuration for where the folder is. And then this is where we get into file naming conventions. You train the software to know when to ignore files with certain names. So you could ignore any file that has .xls, for example, or Polaris for some reason, um, or removal files. It wants to know what kind of files indicate that this file is a removal. That is, it'll automatically delete the matching files in Evergreen. So files that have the files that have uh, getting feedback. You guys, can you guys still hear me? Yep. Yep. OK. I think I'm on two meetings at once. I'm getting the other person. There we go. <laughs> uh, OK, so it can uh, remove, add, and it'll also process authorities. So you know, a file naming convention for files that it would encounter that have the word authority on them or whatever. Um, if it if you do configure it to do authorities, it needs to know where to find this other script, which comes out of uh, another repo. It's it's mentioned in here, the Git ESI library repo here. Um, then it does an email notification also. So when it's finally done, it'll send a summary to any number of email addresses that you provide here, and then it. Another feature this thing can do is manipulate the mark. So if your routine is to always remove the 520 or to add a 650 or manipulate a, the subfield three, this this can has been able, has been programmed to practically cover almost every base that we've ever encountered. It gets pretty hairy down in this area where you define a whole slew of things you want to do to the A56s or whatever. But I only have five minutes, so am I? Did I get to the end? Do I am I out, am I out of time? <laughs> you are technically out of time, but there isn't a next person, so I have a question for Blake then. <laughs> yeah. Um. So if I'm under, I I don't know if I'm understanding this correctly. Is this essentially Vandalay plus authentication to? actually connect with these services rather yeah, than I, sh I should have probably said that on the outset yeah this is first of all it can handle like humongous r record loads so mm -hmm. vandalay kind of has a limit i mean it, right. it it chokes down sometimes um you know hundred thousand no problem you know half a million no problem um it's base is vandalay but it adds the nines and it has the ability to completely arbitrarily edit the mark as it's coming in. It does um, it does other sorts of matching on the URLs. So if you have an 856 coming in, and you've got a matching a a matching bib inside the database. It'll go and look at the subfield U and figure out if the URL is exactly if these are the exact same 856 and go ahead and just plop the nines on the existing 856. It does it basically does everything that you would want it that everybody that evergreen doesn't do automatically for the most part you would have to do them by hand with like mark edit or something ahead of time um it's like seven or eight years in the making to get to this kind of swiss army knife import script so right now it it creates a schema in the database of its own and does a bunch of stuff. And you can report, you can use the reporter to report out its results. Plus, you get the summary email at the end. Is there a goal to um, have a staff side interface for this? Well, it's theoretically possible because it does record a lot of its goings on in the Evergreen database. So, an interface could. Yeah be put on top of it, though, no, it's mostly a sysadmin thing. So a library would approach the the sysadmin for an import from some some place, and okay. they would set up, set up a configuration. OK, cool. Thank you. Internal DB triggers. Bypass them. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Michelle. So this room will stay open, I think, because uh, the Lightning Talks room is open. I am going to leave to go to another session. So please feel free to continue the conversation. OK. Well, yeah, on the it just inserts into BiblioRecord entry, so all the triggers happen. 
like normal. Yeah. 